Okay, great. Thanks. Uh, everyone can hear me? Good. Um, we had a good talk <laughs> before, so that was, we're done. That's it. That's the whole thing. Let's go home. <laughs> um, I am embarrassed to say that I actually gave this talk before at this conference. Two years ago, we had a Postgres day. I wasn't aware, but somebody came up to me today and they said, aren't you giving the same talk you gave two years ago? And they're like, they said it was really good. And I'm like, I did, and I get my phone out really quick to find out because I record where I give my talks, so I don't do this mistake. Um, and in fact, that's what happened. So I submitted this talk or somebody, no, I must have submitted this talk and not realizing I'd already given it. Did anyone see it two years ago? Yeah, I did. I thought this was the updated. No, no. <laughs> Great, okay, I'm sorry about that. I am sorry about that. This is not the updated version. Uh, unfortunately, it's the same version. Um, so I have, I actually, uh, I actually have over 30 talks on my website, uh, and this is one of them. So I usually pick something of the, one of the other 30 talks to submit, and unfortunately, I did this mistake. So we only have one person who's seen it before. I feel pretty good about it. Uh, it is an interesting talk, and the reason it's interesting and I'm going to try and walk over here and see if I don't get a lot of feedback. But uh, the reason it's interesting is because it tries to look at Postgres from a different angle. So it looks at Postgres basically from the outside and tries to see what somebody from the outside can actually do to Postgres. Like how, m what type of malicious things can somebody do to Postgres and how to prevent that from happening. All right. Um, and, and the reason it's interesting is because it's a database. So again, normally you, you, you have certain things that you use for server configurations and so forth, but this is obviously a database, so it has a little different uh, set of requirements when you're looking at security, and I'm basically going to be talking about them from a database perspective. Okay? So uh, again, yeah, this is my website down here. Um, the, web, the, pro, the slides are there. I've also submitted them to the, to the organization organizers, so I'm sure they'll show up on the website at the same time. Um, so we're going to talk about attack vectors. How can you actually attack a database? Specifically, I'm talking about Postgres, but frankly, it probably relates to any other database. I'm going to talk about Postgres specifically myself. Um, by the way, uh, my name is Bruce Momgen. Been working with Postgres for 16 years. Work for Enterprise DB. They sponsor my community work uh, and have for about seven years now. Um, so what we're going to talk about today is some of the uh, security you can set uh, in Postgres. We're going to talk about passwords and how they're kind of configured in Postgres. Then we're going to talk about some network issues and sort of network security in relation to Postgres, which I think is going to be kind of interesting. And then we're going to talk kind of at the back end about uh, sort of some of the the, the issues with backups and things like that. So again, not a super complicated, but, but we are going to kind of build kind of from the, from, the, from the bottom up. What we're not going to be talking about is external attack, internal attack vectors. These are cases where somebody's already been given access to your, to your database and they use it somehow to, to escalate their privileges. So this would be something like SQL injection attacks where you use sort of single quotes inside your string to kind of get another command into the stream, if you've ever done that, seen that before. Application vulnerability, permission, stuff like that. We're not going to cover that. doesn't mean they're not important. It's just not the focus of this talk here. So any questions? Okay. So let's start with um, a file here. This happens to be the file called pghba.com. This is the configuration file that comes with Postgres. And um, the first thing we notice here is that we have a authentication method over here on the right-hand side. And the way Postgres comes in its, in its source distribution, it actually comes with a trust flag. And what the trust flag effectively says is that I allow anyone to connect to my database who's on the local machine. Um, there is a way of changing that. There's a dash capital A flag that allows you to change the default permissions you get when you install from source. Most packagers will not use trust. They'll use MD5, they'll use peer, which I think is a, a new uh, security we have. So again, um, you might want to look at your HBA file and see how your security is set up um, and basically what, you know, what controls you have. This, um, this file is kind of interesting. There's quite a bit of, um, of cool stuff you can do here. I'm not going to go into it too much, but 
um, basically it's it, it, it's like a big filter file so you can do cool things like say I want this network to come in and I want it to use SSL and I want uh, I want it to use uh, password trust, you know, MD5 trust, or I want, uh, let's see, I want LDAP to be used from this network, but I want to exclude a couple of machines in that same network. Um, so there's a lot of cool stuff you can do here uh, in terms of security. I'm not going into it, I'm just kind of highlighting that trust method and, and showing you other ways of setting it up. Um, there is a, a, an authentication method in Postgres called password. Uh, I know it's, it sounds real easy, but you shouldn't be using it. Uh, the reason you don't want to use it is because the password effectively gets sent across the network with no encryption at all. So it basically is just a clear text version of the password that gets sent across. Now this isn't a problem if you're, if you're doing everything on the same machine. So if you're going localhost, well obviously nobody can snoop that network because it's on the same machine. You're using Unix domain sockets or even in TCP, all that network is on the same computer. But if you're going from computer to computer, password is probably never the one that you want to use. What you probably want to use if you're going to pass passwords back and forth is something called MD5. Uh, that might be kind of a funny name, but in fact it's, it's called that because it's a basically a hashing algorithm that we use to identify um, how to s basically how to hash the passwords as they go across the network. Okay, um, the first thing you might kind of wonder about that is, well, okay, so you're, you've MD5 hashed the password, but how does that really help me because somebody can just look at the password going across the wire and then resend the same hash across the network, right? So if you ever imagine what would happen, effectively they've hashed the password. Um, I don't get to find out what the password is, um, but I do get to find out I can basically replay that password back uh, as a new user. Okay. Uh, fortunately, that can't work with, po with, uh, with Postgres. And the reason is because the, um, the client, w before it sends the password back, will actually run MD5 twice. So what happens is the client connects and says, I want to connect. The server comes back and says, I need a password, but also, I've got this random salt I'm going to send you. And when you send that password back, I need you to use that random salt as part of that packet coming back. So the client basically says, okay, I'm going to take the password the user supplied to me. I'm going to concatenate or append to that the username. Okay? So we've got the, uh, we've got the password and the username. I've unfortunately spelled, misspelled username. I will fix that, okay? And I'm going to MD5 that, okay? And then I'm going to take the salt that was passed to me by the server, and I'm going to append that to my MD5, and I'm going to MD5 again, okay? And then I'm going to send that back to the, to the server. And the server actually stores its passwords as MD5 hashes of the username and password. And then, so what this the, the server will do is say, okay, I sent him that random salt. I'm going to take the password entry that I have stored. I'm going to MD5 that again with the same salt that I sent to the person. I'm going to compare the two strings. If they match, I'm good. Okay. So how does that actually work in practice? Normally, I want to connect. Here's a password, and here's a random salt. He s the person sends it back. They basically get an authentication, and they're fine. Okay. Um, However, a malicious database client could make the connection. It could receive the password and the salt. If it tries to replay the same string that it saw on the wire before, effectively the database will say, no, that doesn't work. It, it does not match the salt that I passed you, and therefore you can't get in. Okay, so yes, sir? I'm sorry? Oh, how do you spell that nonce? I've never heard that term before. Okay, so why is it not a salt? Oh, you mean they salt all the passwords the same? They use the same salt for all the passwords? Uh, 
Okay. Oh, 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 and you're right. We're not using um, we're not using a, a anything when we store it. We store it without any randomization. Okay, we just kind of came up with this because we realized that replay wasn't good. Um, the big problem, frankly, that we have with this design is the salt is only 32 bits. And you might think, oh, that's not going to repeat very often. But when you think of the birthday problem, you know, like how many people have a birthday? It turns out I think you only have to do like 16,000 tries, 16, tries before you get a replay or something like that. So I'm not really happy with that. I think we need to go to 64 bits. Um, we, we sort of haven't done that yet. Um, but I, I would like to see us go in that direction. And unfortunately, we didn't think of that at the time. Uh, when we originally designed this, this was in like the late 90s. And 64-bit support wasn't in most of our operating systems. So it would have been kind of hard. We probably could have done a way of kind of making a hybrid 64-bit, but we didn't, we didn't think of that at the time. And that's, that's sort of a flaw, I think, in this design. Okay. Other questions? So, um, what doesn't this cover? Well, it doesn't cover weak passwords, it doesn't cover reasonable passwords, and it doesn't really cover brute force password attacks, okay? If you need this type of security, and many people do, we're basically going to recommend that you use an external tool that is designed specifically for this type of, of capability. So LDAP, PAM, uh, SSPI, uh, these would be the normal things that you would use to sort of prevent that type of, of vulnerability. And again, most people who are doing, um, you know, who are doing large organizations are, you know, easier uh, than doing that kind of thing that we did, authenticate users, which is kind of, kind of cool. Um, so again, there are a whole bunch of ways to do authentication. The problem, though, is that we're, we just kind of talked about getting somebody into the database. The problem is we really should also be worrying about what gets sent across the wire. Okay, so just because we've encrypted the password and we've authenticated cleanly doesn't mean we're in the clear. It, well, it, it literally means we're still in the clear because we're clearly sending our data across the network with no, no security at all. Okay, so the queries are coming across, the results are coming back, show me this person's pass, you know, how much does he make, the number comes back on the wire, you know, no, there's nothing there, okay. So effectively, yes, yeah, select star from customers, and then all the customer data comes back. Uh, this is obviously not something we want. Anybody who's snooping on that network can see what's going on. So we have to start thinking of what happens. Not maybe not maybe you're not worried about this within your organization, but what happens when somebody is doing this across the internet? Okay, kind of coming in. You can do that. Uh, you know, is that is that really what you want? So a lot of people are saying, oh well, okay, uh, I want to use SSL. And they sort of think that solves all their problems, but it doesn't all solve all the problems, and I'm going to get to that. So what SSL typically does, and a little, little detail um, of how it works, is effectively it connects. Um, it basically generates uh, a negotiated secret key between the client and the, and the server, and then it uses a, a, like an encryption algorithm like AES-256. I don't know what AES stands for, but it can't be American auto standards, but... American encryption standard. Oh, not too, not too, not too <laughs> far off. Um, so uh, basically, um, it's going to it's going to encrypt it as it goes back, and then it's going to use the same secret key to send the results. So you know, you're thinking, oh wow, okay, I'm done. This is great. You know, I'm now encrypted. I've I've got my authentication working. You know, my job's done. Well, not really, because there's this guy, and. Um, I talked about snooping before, but this guy is spoofing. And I know it sounds like the same word, but it's really, it's really different. Okay, snooper is kind of just looking at what's going across, and you're sort of like looking through the blinds. The spoofer effectively sort of pretends he's someone else. And how does that actually apply here? Well, let's look at um, uh, a one example, which I think is kind of creepy, and we, we do document this, and, and it's kind of a, something I don't hear a lot about. Um, but if, for example, if the server is down, your database server is down, it's possible because the server typically listens on an unsecure port for somebody to just start up a server and like ask for passwords. 
Okay, they can't do anything with them. They can't actually accept any queries because they don't have any data. They only access the data. But effectively, client says, I want to connect. Server says, give me a password and give me a plain text password. Okay? Client says, okay, here's the password. And boom, you're done. Okay, you've sent that password. And then the person just says, well, you know, user, user disallowed or whatever. Invalid password just goes away. And it collects a whole bunch of passwords. And then later on, it's got a whole pool of passwords it can use. Kind of scary, yeah. Well, um, and I have little, 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 um, little text right down here. Um, but basically, what the little text says is that it uses a fake socket or binds to port 5432, while the real server is down. Okay, and because the socket by default is in the temp directory. Okay then if you can basically create a, so a socket as not root, and it's not a root, it's not a root only port, it's under 124, so zero to 123 are root only, but we don't require root, so you know, it's like, hey, here, let's go, you know. And, and again, all it has to know about is enough to do the protocol, like the negotiation of the thing. It doesn't have to execute any queries, it doesn't have to do anything, it can just basically like hiccup. And this is a problem, you know, it, it's, it, it may not happen very often, but you know, who would have thought that a server being down is a security problem? I hadn't realized it until somebody mentioned it to me. I was like, I, I know, I, I might have thought of it myself. I don't know. It, it just wasn't good. So we do document this is sort of something that's not good. Okay. Um, so that, that's one example of a somebody spoofing uh, of the real database. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm going to get to that in a minute. So effectively, yeah, so basically what happens here, he just records the password, um, and, you know, he's basically pulling in. Let's see, hold on. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Now, that requires that the person that is uh, doing the spoofing knows the secret or the user. No, because the, the, the person basically says, I want to connect as user Fred, yeah. and <laughs> that... <laughs> The, the, the fake guy has no idea if Fred's a valid username or not and doesn't care, okay? Just basically says, okay, give me your password. And he's like, okay, here we go, yeah. And it's like, eh. <laughs> um, So I, I, it's kind of a scary example, I think. Um, and, and maybe a reason to use, a, you can't use a secure port in Postgres. Um, there, are, there's a, there, is, there is an answer to this, fortunately. Um, and, but you can kind of start to see where, where it's going as a spoofer some of the things you can do, okay? Um, this is a man in the middle attack, okay? This is not kind of a man in the middle because there's nobody on the other side, right? But this is a man in the middle attack and effectively what this does is the database says, okay, I want to connect and the fake server says, um, uh, give me a password in plain text and the plain text password is sent to the fake server and as soon as it gets, it, it actually then passes it through to the real server, logs in, okay, and then all the queries that are just passing through here and then coming back out, and this person's acting as a middle uh, person, but obviously is now, can see everything that goes across, all right? Um, doesn't, doesn't make me feel real good, but it's certainly a reasonable concern. And you might say, um, oh, I'm going to fix this. I'm going to use SSL prefer, which happens to be the fault for Postgres. Not a great default. We've discussed it for a long time. But SSL prefer happens to be the default when you turn SSL on at the client. So anyway, um, the, the database says, I would love to do SSL with you. And the fake server says, no, I don't have SSL. Mm -hmm. Okay. And because it's prefer, it's not require, it's like, well, okay, we'll do non-SSL. And I'll have your password and I'll send it over here and I'll send your query back. And the client has no idea that somebody in the middle has I prefer not, <laughs> yeah. So we do have a mode called require. It says, I require SSL. Oh, it sounds so secure, doesn't it? Okay. So the client says, I want to connect by SSL. And the fake server says, OK, I can do SSL. Let's, let's do SSL. <laughs> and the fake server, the real client talks to the fake server and gives it the password. Oh, but of course, the SSL is between this guy and this guy. So everything is decrypted over here. The fact that we've secured this channel really has not bought us any type of security, 
Okay, so effectively it decrypts the password, it sends it over to the real server, and we're back to the same cycle here. Okay, so even the require doesn't really kind of do it for us. Um, the only thing that really locks away that um, that person in the middle is uh, SSL certificates. And I don't know how many of you have dealt with SSL certificates. Great. Um, they're kind of important. I know they're kind of also a pain because if you've dealt with SSL certificates, you've got to like put them on every machine and you've got to manage them and you have to have some kind of key signing and there's all sorts of crazy things where you sort of encrypt them and you put them in a bundle and you've got a password to decrypt it 